everyone, and welcome to a special edition episode of the Points of Experience podcast. If you've read the title already, then you know that there is no guest this week, and it's because I've decided to make a special edition. I said that already, right? This is a special edition. Well, it's literally just an episode that is going to be separate from the interview portions because this is a question I get asked. I'm not even exaggerating multiple times a week. I wanted to say every day, but that would just be insane. Like 365 people every year asking me this question. No, but a lot of people ask me. I get, you know, friends of friends, people I haven't heard from, people who follow me, whatever it is. I get emails, direct messages, phone calls. I random people knock on my door. Um, people I meet walking down the street, they always ask, how do I become an actor? Or even more specifically, how do I become a voice actor? And I also get this with colleagues, people who are specifically like theater and film people, they want to become voice actors or voice actors that are interested in getting into, you know, more on camera stuff. The question comes up so often. And for a lot of you who are aspiring to become either uh, an actor or voice actor. At the end of the day, you're an actor anyway, so it doesn't really matter. This is applicable to both things. There's just kind of like nuances that go on um, in between to navigate down a certain path a little bit more specifically. So this episode is going to be dedicated to that question. How do I become an actor? How do you become an actor, a voice actor, that's going to be in parentheses because you got to become an actor first, in my opinion. At the And, and again, let's preface this episode too with the, the saying of this is all my opinion. Everything I say is extremely subjective and you can take one phrase of it. You can take the whole thing. You can take some from me, some from other people. It doesn't matter. <clears throat> Apply this how, how, how you will, as you wish. And At the end of the day, I think you are going to carve your own path and you're going to do things that you've invented yourself. And I think that's probably to to start this off and say like whatever you think your best road is, however you think you can best pursue this career might ultimately be the best way to do it because everything has been done. You know, like how many people have gone through the same system the same way and how many people get shot out? Not that many. It's just there's such a clog of people trying to pursue the arts. And it's so competitive. Yes, there's a lot of streaming platforms. Yes, there's a, there's a lot of different ways that you can uh, have your art be on display. You know, you can be a podcast. You could be in a, a play. You could be in a TV series for Hulu, Netflix, uh, Peacock, Paramount Plus, in movie theaters, in, in film festivals. It's like video games, commercials, promo. It, there's just so much stuff to do. So you would think like, wow, it must be so easy to, you know, get in. There just seems like there's so much to do. And there is, but there's just even more people that are able to pursue this career, which is great. But it just means you have to really stand out. Whatever you have that makes you unique, whatever you have that is ha- hasn't been seen before or is just so good it's undeniable, which I believe is a, a quote from Steve Martin, which I've said countless of times before, but you really have to be kind of the best around. So I want to I want to go into this on this episode and hopefully this will become a resource that anybody can send to their friend, I can send to anyone, really that's what it's going to come down to, is me sending this to the people, this episode, when they're like, how do I get into this? Because it just becomes overwhelming, the same thing, and I have a resource on my website. If you go to paulcastrojr.com slash links, there are tons of resources on how to get started in all this stuff, you know, I and listen to any podcast episode, the culmination of a lot of information is is really what I would suggest overall. You know, just consume as much as you can from everybody. The other p- podcasts on acting, voice acting, memoirs, um, biographies, see how other people did it and see maybe where you can take inspiration from somebody's story and convert it into something that applies to you. You know, for instance, like, uh, let's just use Sylvester Stallone, for instance. You know, he was an actor that nobody really thought was attractive. He said, you got this kind of voice going on. So they thought he wasn't bookable. He was so desperate. He was broke. He had no money. He had to sell his dog at a point to just survive. And he wrote Rocky 
I believe he said in the course of a night and he just was fueled by like, this is my only chance I need to survive. And he convinced these studios to let him star in the film. He was just so brazen and emboldened and confident in himself, even though I think he discussed this in something recently where he was like, he was terrified as most of us are who appear confident, but you know, he wound up making his own movie starring in it about a story that has been told before in different versions, but you know, this triumphant fighter, uh, against the odds an underdog story. And that's what kind of really set him on his career. So it was, you know, that's one way of doing. You look at the do Wow. Sometimes I stutter, you know. I actually, I do stutter quite often. The Duplass brothers, they made short films. They went to the Sundance Film Festival. They wound up just writing together and making stuff. And Mark Duplass also being an actor. And then eventually Jay Duplass also being an actor too. But they went the film festival circuit. You look at like... um. The the girls from uh, Broke City, or Broad City, <laughs> Broke City, <laughs> Broad City, you know, they made their own television series that started on YouTube and eventually got picked up. Same with the guys from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Um, there's a lot of, you know, voice actors that the creators of their own shows, you know, um, you look at like Dan Harmon with Rick and Morty, um, Judd, uh, not Judd Apatow, Mike Judge with uh, King of the Hill, you know, these people that have made their own story, their own voice, they put their own voice in it and it becomes the inception of their career. So whatever, there are multiple ways of, of making your own path viable. I think the first thing you have to do before you do anything, and before I even talk about this, is make a list of what makes you unique. What are your talents? What is What are the defining features that you have that that is not been seen before or even if they they have been seen maybe the way you do it is different than somebody else you know everybody can juggle but do you juggle really fast do you use a certain type of ball what is the thing that you do and let's use now me for example i mean i'm an actor what can be so different i think what i'm bringing is a very fiery passion with also a very dedicated business and uh, entrepreneurial mindset to things, and I'm, I'm extremely, extremely vulnerable. Pack all that into like a a young sounding voice and kind of a you know long haired body type of guy. So I have so many different layers of me going on. Be, me being just me and being excited about my passions, video games, running, um, animals, uh, the welfare of, of you know many different animals and the way they're treated. Um, you know, I'm a vegan and things like that. All my different things that I bring with my history and my family make me unique. And I try to lean into those things whenever I can if I get sides for an audition. I try to do it the way that I would do it based upon my life and experiences. If I'm writing something, I write from a, a very personal perspective. I write about things that have happened in my life. I write about stories that mean a lot to me that don't get talked about. I wrote a TV series about a group of video gamers. I wrote a movie about a cat that had a very specific um, and deadly disease called FIP. So these were things that hadn't really been done before. I mean, the video game thing, but not the way I had thought of doing this when it was just a, a more adult sitcom style or single camera, but sitcom comedy way. So that's the things that make me unique, and I try and I constantly try to lean into those. Now let's take a huge rewind. You're somebody, maybe you've never been in, you didn't do theater in high school like I didn't. You never pursued any type of art form ever, and you're waking up today saying, I am interested in acting. I want to be an actor. I want to be in films. I want to be in movies. I want to be voiceover, whatever. The advice I would give to you is you have to convert that desire into an undying passion. And I think that happens by engrossing yourself with whatever you can. So for acting, going to plays all the time, going to stage readings, going to movies, going, uh, watching TV and movies at your home, 
reading monologues, going to film festivals, making short films on your own, like all of these things in, in obsessing yourself with this idea and love for acting. Because once you've like <clears throat> kind of ultimately exhausted yourself, if you still love it at the end of it and you're still craving more, then that means you're probably on the right track. So let's assume that you're obsessed with it. you've consumed all these things and we're going to get back to that. We're going to put a pin in that. The first thing that I would do is seek out a class of any kind. It could be on camera. It can be theater. It can be voiceover. Any of these classes and audit it and see what it's like to train as a performer. Before we even get into you taking your own class and the different disciplines and blah, 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 blah. I would first audit a, to see what it's like being a student because you're going to be a student your whole life. And once you've tried out this audited this class on Zoom or you're going to a, a place near you, if you're in a big city like New York, Chicago, Boston, Texas, Los Angeles, Toronto, the big cities are going to have a more abundance of this. But even in smaller cities, I'm sure there are acting classes all over. And there's markets in, in these places too. They, you know, whether it's the film incentive of the city or, I mean, Atlanta, Georgia has just exploded. So there's many different places. Go to a, a close city or again, Zoom. Find a teacher who is reputable. Find a class that has good reviews or good testimonials. Hopefully personal. If you can find somebody who has personally gone through this. And I'll give you some of my resources as well here probably. But once you've audited it, you're like, yes, great. I'm, I want to do this. I want to sit down and learn. Sign me up. You can take that class. But I would highly recommend learning in the theater, taking a, a study or a discipline, and we're going to go through the various ones right now. Most things are derived from Stanislavski, right? And um, that is kind of uh, living truthfully under extraordinary circumstances. You know, that's kind of like one of the key principles to acting. <laughs> but there's many different iterations of that. There's the Strasbourg, which is known as the method. There's the Atlantic School in New York. There is uh, Stella Adler. There is Michael Chekhov. There is Stan Sanford Meisner. There is uh, like experimental theater. I'm really just listing kind of the things that were at NYU. There's musical theater, which was Cap 21 in New York. There is... Do, 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 there's probably many more. There's tons. And I would research all of these these methods of acting. And there's probably people who have made their own along the way. You know, you can even like master class. I think Samuel L. Jackson has a class. And, uh, and you can also watch the ones from a director's perspective too to see what it's like once you are cast in something. Because ultimately, no matter what you do, you're going to be working with a director if it's not yourself directing your own piece of content. But um, so... You've, you've decided on your discipline, right? For me, I went to the Meisner Studio in NYU. And if you're in college, you can look at the various different universities and see the way that they train. Maybe they list the discipline, or at least you can look up the teacher in their background. Um, because even within my acting conservatory, which is where you're engrossing yourself in multiple th different things. So I was doing movement, voice and speech, stage combat, um, accents and dialects various different types of movement. We did like Suzuki, we did Alexander, we did Williamson, all these names of people that have originated their own version of things. And see which thing jives with you. You know, some might, some might not, but you have to try it or research to know about it. YouTube is a great place as well too. So if you're if you if you're pursuing a college version of this, that's that's one way of doing it, but you can also do a studio that is outside of the university uh, curriculums. So you found your place to study to become an actor. I would definitely study as long as you can. Most of these things, like Meisner has like a two-year minimum. The whole first year you spend basically deconstructing what you think acting is and listening and repeating, doing something called repetition. So you don't even work on scenes, like actual written scenes, until your second year because they're just trying to teach you to be like someone who can listen and respond, which most of us don't really do when we're trying to quote-unquote act. Which was one of the things I loved about it. It kind of didn't require like uh, 
I, you do script analysis and stuff, and that's a huge part of it. And in my first college, Mom at the University, where I went, we did a lot of script analysis, you know, writing out the beats. And a beat is kind of like a, a section or a space. Either um, a beat can be a couple of lines that move to a next beat, or a beat can literally be a moment of silence in between a set. So, and there's micro beats, small beats, long beats, you know, uh, mega beats, whatever. And, um, so I really enjoyed Meisner. I really enjoyed uh, spending that whole year doing that and then eventually converting that into to working on scenes. If you're in this theater program or, or training for theater, great. Um, there's tons of schools like in the city. To, I mean, New York City predominantly is what I know, like the Esper Studio, Maggie Flanagan. This was all Meisner, but there's the new school. There's tons. There's tons and tons and tons of schools. Just look for the reviews and see if you can audit a class. If it jives, great. Once you've been studying and you have kind of an understanding of what it's going to be to act, say you do get cast in something, the next part is understanding what auditioning is. So first first and foremost, us as actors, our job is to audition. You spend most of your time in your life rehearsing lines in your bedroom for a job that you may never get and you're not going to get paid for. Although there is news out now about actors, you know, how historically we were supposed to get paid for auditions and maybe that will change. Um, we will have to see <laughs> if that is the case. But for me, I am doing voiceover auditions all day, every day. I'm doing on-camera auditions all day, every day, theater auditions all day, every day. And that is a whole separate process to actually doing the job cold reading which when you get the script on the day of or a, a night before you're not having rehearsal time you got to learn to audition well so if you can find an audition coach great those people are going to help you get the job once you've gotten the opportunity to get the job and i would be preemptive in doing that don't wait for the audition to come around and then be like i got to find an audition coach no have someone who you work with who can help you who can read lines with you and can help you break down the scene all that stuff. So that way when you're ready to perform, because every audition you should treat like it's the job that you have, because how else are you going to book it if you're not treating it like it's game day? You know, I, I really do think of acting as a sport in that capacity. And you got to show up for game day. You got to be ready to play on every rehearsal, every practice. So that's the the kind of the, the key principles here is you got to learn how to act. You got to be in an acting class. You got to um, be ready to book the job once you get the opportunity to get the job. And you got to know what to do when you're on the set. So how do you know what to do once you're on a set if you've never been in one? Student films. Uh, independent theater productions. Um, making your own pilot with your friends. Like doing things on your own so that way when you book a job, you're not surprised by anything. You can you you know the terminology. You know what blocking means. You know what a spike means. You know what not spiking the lens means. You know um, like what OC means off camera. These different acronyms for things. And I mean for voiceover, it's extremely specific. Um, I mean voiceover as like you know we talk about different genres or, or, or disciplines of acting. Voiceover has a hundred different genres. You know we got narration. Promo, commercial, animation, video game, anime, IVR, um, educational, uh, in infomercial, industrial. There's just tons of different versions, and you want to work with people who can train you for each style of thing. Because it's not kind of a acting isn't a one size fits all. You know, comedy and drama. You kind of approach them the same way, but there's different skill sets you can utilize to excel in them. So being really learned of all the different things, because it is so competitive, I believe you can't truly, as an aspiring actor, unless you get really lucky, survive just being an on-call actor in one medium. You got to be able to do commercials on camera. You got to be able to do voiceovers. You got to be able to do dubbing for live action. You got to be able to do... Uh, go sees for print print ads. You got to be able to do trailers, whatever it might be. I feel like the more that you are a learned actor, you can put your skill set into different genres and give you more ways to get employed. 
Because that's the other thing too. People think, you know, I want to become an actor and become rich and famous. No, you want to become an actor to become employed and stay employed and keep getting employed. That is the hardest thing to do because you finish a job and then you're unemployed. And you got to get another job to keep that, you know, paying your rent, to pay your health insurance, to all these different things. So you you have to have a good understanding of all these things. And navigating the business too is a whole separate thing that we're going to get into. But you're in your acting class. You've got a good coach. You've got all, you know, your kind of tools of learning how to act. And now you've gotten to a point where you're, you're, you're really good at your craft for whatever your experience level is. You feel like you could audition competitively. And your coaches and your teachers are going to be able to tell you when that is. More often than not, if you've done a two-year or four-year program, you're, you're probably ready to start learning trial by fire, so to speak. Then you're going to want to acquire um, your materials for everything. So your materials are like your headshot, your resume, your demos, your, your voice reels, your websites, everything you can show to somebody – trying to cast a project or straight book you that you have what it takes to do the job and that you're right for this specific job. Like, let's say, you know, they're, they're casting, uh, for me, a, a young rebellious guy in this new TV, TV series. I've got plenty of that on my reel. I've played many different versions of that where it's not me exactly doing the role that they're looking for, but it's something similar. So they're going, okay, yeah, Paul has some some good chops. It's good acting range too for the intensities and levels that are in this this um, anime or this um, on-camera role. You know, you, you have to have a reel to showcase that. And your headshot should show you who you truly are, not like glamour shots as they were traditionally in, in previous years. So you want to have a good headshot that shows you who you are. Oftentimes multiple headshots. You're going to want theatrical, which is more serious, kind of the more you know, uh, gloomier, but more serious. And you're going to want commercial shots to, you know, show maybe for comedies or for literal commercials. You're going to want your theatrical and your commercial headshots. And nowadays people are actually want like character shots where you're, you're kind of embodying these specific roles specifically for commercials. Like, you know, if you're a, a, uh, an attorney, they want you in a suit. If you're a, a football player, they want you in sports gear. So, you don't have to get that extreme right up front, but the most important thing is definitely a good theatrical and a good commercial headshot. Um, when you meet with these agencies and management companies, they're going to tell you exactly what they want. But at least one of those is going to help you get through a door. Then is going to be your reels. You can get reels done by doing like student films and stuff. You can do it by student animation projects, whatever the medium you're trying to really excel in. Find the students that are in university that are doing things pretty well with like, you know, it's you can get a DSLR camera or a shotgun microphone and still be a college student and make something of quality. That's a great way to start your reel. Or you can hire a service that will, you know, for voiceover demo producers, they'll produce it for you if you haven't done a bunch of spots. Or for on camera, it, they'll write the scenes. I, this is what I used to do when I lived in New York is, you know, you write scenes for people and you shoot them like li little mini short films that are tailored to who you are as a performer, the things that you excel at. You've assembled that. You put that all on a website for casting directors and agents and all that people to easily find. Then you're going to want to submit yourself like on places like Actors Access and Backstage, Casting Networks, LA Casting, New York Casting. All these casting sites that are going to be accessible direct to like the consumer. You don't have to go through an agent or a manager. You can sign up and get an audition for an indie film or an indie project and get paid. That's going to be a great way to show an agent or a manager that you are bookable, you're dependable, you're professional, and you're talented. Because that project might go on to do something. That project that was an indie, non-union, no-budget thing might go on to get picked up by something or go to a film festival. And everybody might know you from doing those things. So you want to find the right people, obviously, and you want to vet, make sure it's something worth your time. But if it is something worth your time, put your all into it and start working kind of at a less, not to say that it is less stakes, but you know, it's not like you're going to be working on a billion dollar project movie. And if you don't know how to act, they got to recast you. And then they're more than likely not going to want to work with you ever again. You know, <laughs> if a bunch of students don't want to work with you, okay, maybe they'll forgive you five years down the road when they've made it. And when you make it. So you've got your materials. You've either worked with a demo producer, you've done a bunch of films, 
Now is where you're going to want to pursue agents or managers. Managers are going to be the people who are a little easier to get because they can introduce you to agents, but they can also help you freelance with various different agencies up front. A manager in the in the traditional sense used to be somebody who would kind of like shape your career. And they still do do that today, but they kind of work as like pseudo agents also too. So if you can submit to a bunch of different management companies, whether by sending your headshot and resume or an email or attending a showcase, which is where you go in and you audition for various people. Basically, you pay a fee. It's kind of like the pay-to-play stuff. Um, if you do one of these pay-to-plays, you want to research and make sure it's something that's right for you, uh, especially the casting director versions of that. I don't recommend them really unless you know that it is a great opportunity for you. Like, Say you would be a perfect candidate because you used to be a doctor and the casting director for Grey's Anatomy is going to be on this thing and you know you can ramble off medical jargon like nobody else and you're the right look. So um, that would be a good casting director opportunity for you to go in for. Or like you're like, I love Euphoria. I'm so right for that. These people look just like me and blah, 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 blah. Then maybe that's a good opportunity for you if you're a young person and you fit that mold. Um, but otherwise, you, you can submit on your own. They might have websites which tell you how you can submit or you send in an email or LinkedIn even maybe. Really, whatever way you can get your stuff in front of these people, this is where I think, you know, what what's the unique way you can do it? I used to put my headshot in like these see-through mailer window things and I'd put them in a red one. So the red manila envelope stood out amongst everything else and you could see my headshot without even having to open it up because back then there'd be stacks and so I just wanted to make sure that mine got seen. The very least, my headshot was going to get seen. And a headshot can say a lot. Um, for voiceover, it's a little bit more specific because you need them to open your email with your voice demo. But maybe a lot of people now are doing visual demos. You know, they're getting their their demo reels animated or put to like commercial copies. That's what I did. I found commercial spots that existed kind of already and I changed the the spots or I made them made sure they weren't like very widely known so that no one recognized it and I edited my version onto spots that existed already and I had to put new music in and there's certain people who can you can pay to do that. It's an investment. This career is an investment. It's not just like being an artist and you can show up and you know you can busk on the sidewalk and maybe someone will find you or recite Shakespeare on the subway, which is what I said I'd always do if I you know, wasn't finding success the ways that I was because I needed to, to, to act. I would do anything. But you have to treat it like it's a business. And having people who are good at navigating the business on your team is crucial. Manager is going to help you do that. Manager is going to get you to bigger projects and eventually hopefully get you with an agency who's going to have kind of the elite access points. So that's kind of like the flow, the, you know, the flowing fluid motion to becoming an actor, like the traditional sense. You can also figure out other ways of getting into a different position position that's not you in front of the camera. Like, for instance, working as an engineer in a voiceover studio or, uh, you know, being a sound guy or being a PA and just being around the professional environment that you aspire to be in. A lot of people who want to become comics, they work at, you know, as ushers at the comedy store and they wait patiently for the, for the people who run that place to to like them and give them a chance to go up and do a couple of minutes. I think the same works in any artistic venture. Being around the place where people are doing it at the highest caliber, it can only be beneficial. It's a little bit different of a route because you're going to have to climb your way up, but you can still be pursuing your own thing on your own, Right. So for me, I have an agent, I have a manager, I've done all these things. I have a website, you can find all these things. If you're looking on what they should look like, just look at my materials, right? Go to my website and look at all the things that I have and what I've done. I'm a big fan of producing your own content. I'm a really big fan of producing your own content. Things like Kickstarter right now are ways you can make your own animated series. You can submit those things to like MIPCOM, which is a big global market for you to sell your projects. Film festivals, right? Whatever version of whatever you're trying to do, making your own thing and fooling around with your friends on your iPhone. You know, these things, they've made movies on these. There's no excuse for why you can't make a project with your friends. And learning all the aspects from in front of, behind the camera, the microphone to in front of it, that's only going to be make you better at your job. I did every single thing you can imagine. I've held lights in the freezing cold rain. I was a sound guy. 
I have edited movies. I've edited reels. I've done everything. So I have such a better understanding of what the full picture looks like at the end of it and what my job is involved in that whole big picture. What else can we talk about here, huh? Because there, I think another thing people are curious about is where do you have to live? I really think you can live anywhere today. But obviously being in New York or L.A. is going to be huge, and I think Atlanta is like the number three, and I think it's really competitive there. Being in the city and being around the people for voice acting, being in Dallas is definitely, um, if you want to do anime, that's a great place to be. But even in New York and LA or San Diego, where there's big commercial markets for even like on-camera commercials or voiceovers, that's where the agencies are. So if you're ever curious on like where you should live, look at like where the big agencies are. You know, you could be in even in the UK or, or Canada. There's tons of work being done in these big cities because that's where they can afford to put on these productions um, from like a global brand perspective, you know. Ooh, I spilled some water on myself. <laughs> Once you have figured out all of this stuff and if you acquired it and you've created a place for it and your, your agents and managers are submitting you, it's about doing that good job in the moment and being as kick-ass as you can be when you get that opportunity because not many people do get the opportunities to audition. So you have to show them how you are so good at what you do and the way you do it is unlike anybody else. And that's by being real and being vulnerable and truly connecting with the material in an authentic way, not the way you think that they want it. That's kind of the big long spiel of how you do it voice acting we can get a little bit more specific here you um you need to have a good setup and i think this it does apply for on camera where you need like a decent microphone you need an interface like an xlr microphone that has this little xlr cable here a condenser cardioid condenser microphone is really great you can buy ones that are like two hundred dollars that are competitive an interface like this evo 4 over here which is like a hundred bucks a mic stand an ipad to read your materials and a bunch of acoustic treatment in, in a room or a closet blankets whatever you can do to make your business you know because this is your business sound the most competitive and professional for if you want to be an actor you have a good camera. iPhones are great, but DSLR cameras are also really good. A good lighting, a good backdrop, and most casting offices are going to tell you you don't you don't need this. But there's something to be said for somebody investing in their career. It makes it makes it sure that you're not getting the job that you're not not getting the job because of something you don't have. At the end of the day, what's most important is your performance. But being able to do your performance and not worrying about everything, like not worrying if the light is not good, like can they see me, can they hear me, whatever it might be, if you can remove those complications, it's only going to give you a better chance at doing this for real the way you want to do it. That was something that I learned very quickly, reading books like Acting as a Business by Brian O'Neill, listening to podcasts like Voice Acting Mastery, like this, and listening to people's stories and how they got their jobs. Who were the people that they were working with? So many people, you think about like the, the um, like Luke and Owen Wilson. Bottle Rocket, I believe, was one of their first movies. And, you know, from they were working on a student film and that kind of catapulted their career. Matt Damon and Ben Affleck making their movie, Good Will Hunting. They had done little things, but they had to take control of their career. I, I, I really think uh, uh, Tyler Perry he had a one one man show that he had done and he just kept doing kept doing kept doing kept doing until somebody came and gave him a shot now that's a global empire of uh kind of the 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 Tyler Perry fantasy uh campus so i hope this is kind of helpful in your understanding how you start and how you become some of the classes um you can take on Zoom, right? For voiceover, there's like adventures in voice acting that Bang Zoom hosts. Um, 
most of the professional actors like Richard Horvitz, Crispin Freeman, these people who are working professionals, they'll offer them online. Uh, for on camera, Bob Krakauer or any of the schools that I had mentioned. But, you know, just look up kind of the, the where your favorite people went and kind of retrace the steps back. I told you where I went. I went to NYU, the Meisner Studio. I've done countless classes with like, you know, for voice acting, adventures in voice acting, you know, Mick Wingard I've studied with. I've, you know, personal coaching, um, accents and dialects. You want to have everything that you need to do your job correct. And, and people at the, the biggest level, they're working with coaches all the time. It's about being a constant student, constantly reading the books, reading the, seeing the plays, all of these things. It's People think it's like this big code you have to crack, but it's really just obsessing yourself and immersing yourself in the art and doing it as much as possible. That's how you become one. The way you become one is you you believe it. It's it is a emotional intellectual thing that you embody. When you say I am an actor, you are an actor. It's, there's no aspiring. You're aspiring before you ever have the thought. You know? Like you you're aspiring that moment before you like audit the classes. You're aspiring like, I'm aspiring to learn more. But the second you get in that class and you've committed yourself to pursuing the art form, you are an actor. And that is how you become an actor. You believe it. You believe that it is your life. You believe that it is your utmost passion to perform because you have something you need to say. You have a point of view that you need to get across. You want to tell the truth about something like nobody else has done before. You want to be a part of that storytelling experience. And it's fun. Having fun. I mean, every person on this podcast has talked about having fun. You have to find the joy in it. Some people find joy in being really dramatic and really dark or horror movies. Some people find joy in doing comedy. Maybe it's about if you want to be a comic or or do, you know, comedic shows, going and pursuing stand-up comedy. Doing improv at UCB or The Groundlings. Whatever it is, immersing yourself in it, constantly watching the thing. The people who were, you know, actors back in the day, they were constantly watching the shows, you know? They were, like, it was about going to the big stage and watching even from the, as they, they called them, the, uh, gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting the word now, but basically the people that sat in the pits. There's a term for that. Um, it's escaping me at this moment. Just go and see things support other artists and they'll more than likely want to support you help people out on their short films and they'll want to help you out on yours help people out on their animations they'll want to help you out on yours and just do it talk into the microphone all day try different voices and characters try different characters that have different voices that's the better way of phrasing it on camera read monologues keep doing monologues try scenes find a scene partner with a friend of yours that you can work on scenes together keep doing them and just audition, 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 audition. It is tough. It is not an easy career. I'm not here to tell you that everybody can do it. You have the capacity to do it, but not everybody can hack it. it so many people quit because they just can't deal with the constant like day in, day out of pounding the pavement and trying to survive. But if you love it and you're obsessed with it, you don't look at it that way. That's a good indication if you're if you're having doubts like like man I, I really just want to make it then that's not the right then it's probably not the right career for you. You have to be so in love with it that it's like it's like knitting, you know? You you do it for no money. Obviously you want to get paid and you want to be a good business person and have a very fruitful career in life, but you have to be obsessed with it and you have to treat it like it's it's something that you other people can make money with you being a part of their project on. YouTube is a great place for you to get your voice out there making skits, right? It's a free platform to host your, your, your skits or TikTok. Just performing and getting it out there. If people like what you do, they will find it. And if you like what you do, it'll be good. Doing the things that make you happy, the perspective that you find the most enjoyment from, more than likely there's other people that do. So long as it's like legal and like, you know, nothing weird in the sense of like, it's illegal and don't do that. Um, but that's really kind of the foundation of how you start making it your life, pursuing training, 
I guess where you find the agents is like go to IMDb Pro and research where other people you have to you can get like a seven fourteen day free trial on IMDb Pro. And you can look at every actor, every director, every management company. Most of them have emails listed there or who they're represented by. So when you get to that point, that's how you do that. There's a whole thing with LinkedIn marketing for voiceover. Tons of people who offer those classes. You can learn from their experience and you get what you pay for. People are so mad like you got to pay for certain things. People have done this hard work and they want to be compensated for their time. Everything in life doesn't have to be free. You can find free versions of it, right? They're things that exist, but the same things can be like with headshots. It's very important. Your friend can take a photo of you. Great. But if you want someone who's put in the hours to perfect that shot, to perfect what a reel sounds like, then you should pay what they're asking for because you're not, you're paying for that experience. All the hours that they've practiced that you aren't going to see. Learn as much as you, as much as you can. And while you can live anywhere, I think being in a place like LA or New York feeds that fuel and gives you accessibility to things that are going on, like theater or performances all the time. And that's what keeps it alive. Me, even just going to the movie theaters in your local town and seeing the movies that are being made, that will inspire you to to want to keep doing it. Every time I go to a movie, I just have an itch to want to go make one myself. So I, I, I really want to um, make sure I've covered everything. And I think I have, you know, the, the the student, like MFA programs, they're constantly making things and they want to work with new actors, people who don't mind getting paid, sometimes unpaid, but if you're lucky, a hundred dollars a day, check out the universities that are near you, find the programs that are doing the animation, film, theater, get involved, do community theater, get your film, get your feet wet, get your film wet, don't get your film wet because then you can't use it. Get your, get your feet wet and know what it's like to be on stage. Know what it's like to be acting for an audience. Go to an open mic night. Do karaoke. Do these things at a very low stakes level and then pursue it like crazy. Ask your teachers the next steps. What do they recommend? Who are coaches they recommend for, you know, uh, movement, accents and dialects, um, mic technique? The, the resources are out there. I want to be a voice actor.com, the masterclass website, tons of podcasts, seminars. If you're in SAG AFTRA, which is the union, there's tons of resources there. And you can get in the union by doing background work or new media contracts. You can actually get into SAG by making all of your own productions, making your own films. It's crazy. So, I really hope that those of you who are extremely passionate about becoming an actor, that you stop waiting for an excuse to do it. Stop waiting for permission. You have the permission to be an actor today. You are an actor. I am an actor. It's one of those weird conversations you always have with your friends or family or grandparents. Like, what do you do? And everyone's like, I don't want to say I'm an actor because they don't know anything I'm in. No, I am an actor. I'm a performer. I'm a comic. I'm an entertainer. I'm a voice actor. Although if you're a voice actor, you're an actor. I'm always going to say that. Conviction, passion, fire in your belly about it. And know that it's going to be very hard and competitive. But you love it. So it's like a video game. You're not going to always be the, the most professional player in the world. But if you love it, you keep playing it. Right? You get better. You learn. Are you... Are you pursuing the thing that you want to pursue from a student mindset too? Like you can love baseball and keep swinging the bat the same way and never learn from your mistakes. You have to make mistakes. You can't just keep doing it the same way. Make new mistakes. Try new things. Try the monologue a different way. Try it with blocking. Try the, the character you're creating with a different accent, with a different cadence, speech pattern. Make mistakes. Make a fool of yourself. Do it in a comfortable place first and then dare to do it when you're doing it professionally because that's how you make shit that's really inspiring when it's something that no one's ever done before. The thing people are too scared to try. And you might have someone say, that's not really what we're looking for, but I appreciate the bold choice. That's the win. That's the win right there. Pursue all the different mediums. 
study the different, you know, disciplines. But that's how you become an actor. That's how you become an actor. Best of luck, everybody. Um, if you have any specific questions, let me know in the comments. But I hope this episode um, really kind of answers that for you and answers everything that there is to answer. Uh, uh, go to my website, paulcasterjr.com slash links. Read the articles. And uh, I, I, I really, if you, if you want to do this and make this your life, you will. There are no gatekeepers. You, you are, you can make your own damn gate. So go do it. Thank you for watching and listening to the Points of Experience podcast. Make sure you subscribe, uh, leave us a review, and all that great stuff. This is uh, kind of a standout episode here, and maybe we'll do more of these. But uh, until next time, um, much love, and we'll see you soon.